Well, we're continuing our look at cults and the occult, and I want to take our focus onto uh, a chapter that Dr. Walter Martin in his book uh, addresses um, to great detail, and uh, we're following along, of course, with Dr. Martin's book and using it really as our main textbook. But he touches on it in one of the chapters. He talks about goddess worship, witchcraft, and Wicca. Uh, when it comes to witchcraft, of course, everybody has heard of witchcraft. Everyone's heard of it. But how many people, and even believers, can accurately define what witchcraft is? There has always been some kind of fascination with witchcraft, uh, especially at this time of the year, all you have to do is go into a grocery store or a department store, and one of the first things you will see when you walk in the door, uh, you're going to see the color orange and black and costumes, and uh, of course, uh, many movies are being played right now, horror movies and other things like that. People have always found some kind of fascination with witchcraft. It's been like that for many, many years. But then a series of books came out, and then movies called Harry Potter. And Harry Potter emerged onto the scene. And suddenly there were parents, and unfortunately even Christian parents, who viewed the Harry Potter series as harmless, when it was anything but harmless. I'm into statistics because I believe that statistics numbers tell usually can tell a story. Back in 19, of course, coming out of the counterculture movement, what I would rather call the hippie movement of the 60s, you get into the early 70s, of course, the feminist movement, which gave birth to, of course, abortion. And Roe versus Wade, 1972. When we as a country, we not only legalized abortion, but we also told God in the same breath that we're going to take your creation and we're going to destroy it before those little ones even have a chance. That was 1972. In 1972, there were approximately, approximately 20,000 witches in North America. That was 1972. But after Roe versus Wade, by the time you got to 1982, which was only 10 years later, the number of witches doubled. 25 years later, it's estimated that in North America, there were between 200,000 and 600,000 witches. We went from 20,000 in 1972 to half a million, perhaps, by 2007. Since Harry Potter, uh, not only is witchcraft now receptive, uh, but witchcraft is actually making boatloads of money, and people are making boatloads of money off of witchcraft. We tend to think of the term witch uh, as being female and wizard, perhaps as being male, the male gender. Uh, but as this study will show, the two terms really are synonymous. And I take you back to Dr. Martin's book. He writes, he says, quote, Historically, a witch is a male or a female who uses supernatural powers for good or evil ends. Hence, the designation in some circles of a white or a black witch. But neo-pagans do not necessarily accept the existence of supernatural power, believing instead in the inherent power of the natural, positive energy present in all things. This redefinition of the term supernatural allows them to categorically reject the evil or occult aspect of power, in that they simply do not believe in Satan. And so the terms white witchcraft or black witchcraft cannot apply to them, end quote. So you see, 
they would tell you, well, since there is no God, there is no Satan, so really, in essence, there is no good or evil. So there can't, there can't be white witchcraft or black witchcraft. We're just tapping into this. We're just tapping into the supernatural. We're tapping into energy. That's all we're doing. Um, witchcraft goes back thousands of years. Archaeologists have uncovered spells, which were carved on ancient Egyptian tombs dating back prior to the Exodus. And so, when you when you find that out. It really is no surprise then when we get to Deuteronomy 18 and the children of Israel, their wilderness wandering is coming to an end. They're going to be going into the land. They left Egypt and what does God tell them? Deuteronomy 18 beginning verse 9. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, that's child sacrifice, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. Notice in that passage I read how closely linked child sacrifice is to practicing witchcraft. If you just see that back in Deuteronomy 18, it's really no surprise that in North America, as I stated moments ago, Roe versus Wade comes around in 1972, and in a matter of, what, 30, 35 years, the number of witches goes from 20,000 to perhaps two, three, four, five hundred thousand. 500,000 when we started killing babies. Of course. Exodus 22, verse 18, you shall not allow a sorceress to live. No. So if the power that they're tapping into is not coming from God, well then where is the power coming from? Well, obviously we know there's only one other source, and it's demonic. And Dr. Martin writes, from a biblical perspective, the ancient religion of witchcraft has maintained its key beliefs and practices throughout many millennia, tracing its polytheistic roots to the time when Moses first recorded God's prohibition against it. Although modern pagans dispute the quote-unquote religious nature of paganism and witchcraft, and do not capitalize these names in order to indicate a spiritual path instead of a religion, its organized belief system still fits easily into the definition of religion. Okay, so here... Again, these witches are saying, well, see, we don't believe in God, we don't believe in Satan, we don't really believe in good and evil, and so we're just tapping into energy. We're not practicing a religion. That's what witchcraft says. On the other hand, Wicca, Wicca willingly says that it is a religion. Where witchcraft claims not to be, Wicca does. Now, it's difficult to trace back Wicca to any one particular founder. Uh, modern uh, Wicca, uh, it's, it's in, in, in academia they would say that uh, modern Wicca, you can trace back its roots perhaps in 19th century Britain. But if we're going back to originally, where did it come from, as far as a religion goes? Um, there's an excellent example of this, actually, in Luke's account of the, in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 8, beginning verse 9, I'll read it to you. Luke writes, now there was a man named Simon, who formerly was practicing magic. That Greek word there is meguo, I'll get to in a second. He was formerly practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria claiming to be someone great, and they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. 
and they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. So that term that we see in the English, practicing magic, miguo, that is the only time that you'll see it in the apostolic scriptures. And perhaps you can see there's a, a, an ancient source, you might say, for the roots of Wicca, as far as it being a religion. Now, those that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, use witchcraft, and I'm, I'm, I'm really blending the two terms, witchcraft and Wicca, together, because really that's six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. But, uh, of course, uh, some individuals that uh, were well known for, let's say, practicing witchcraft or were in Wicca, one of them uh, I just mentioned in a, in a previous lesson, that was Aleister Crowley, early part of the 20th century. Uh, deeply involved in witchcraft. Then you got Gerald Gardner. I'll get to him more in a second, but he was an archaeologist. He went off to Southeast Asia uh, and was dabbling in Malaysian magic. I'll get to him again in a second. You have Margaret Murray. Uh, Margaret Murray was dabbling in, in Wicca and witchcraft. That was back in the 1930s, the 40s, the 50s. She died in 1963. But she made the case that uh, witchcraft predates Christianity. Well, if she's pointing to, uh, let's, let's call it the birth of Christianity, I'm sure that's what she's doing. She's probably pointing to Acts chapter 2 and saying, well, Acts chapter 2 is the beginning of Christianity, and so witchcraft predates that. Well, if that's what, if that's what, uh, uh, what she's trying to say, well, then actually, actually she's exactly right. It go, witchcraft goes back thousands of years. Now, as a religion, Wicca, uh, usually religions have holy books, but Wicca doesn't. There isn't really a holy book. Uh, many witches will use what's called the Book of Shadows, which was compiled by Gardner, that archaeologist. Other popular works include a witch's Bible. Another book is called the Spiral Dance. Okay, so... Here, once again, these are individuals who do not believe in God. We believe that God is triune, a triune Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Comforter. Witches do not. And so they would say, well, there is no God. Uh, but they do worship, Wiccans do worship a supreme being called the Goddess. Uh, some uh, refer to the Lord and the Lady. And so they'll tell you there is no such thing as God. Uh, strangely enough, the very same ones that will say there's no God, well, they have no problem telling you that Jesus was alive. And they'll say, but, you know, he was just, he was just a teacher. He was just a rabbi, and, and he went around, and uh, he, he taught about love, and then, of course, the Romans went ahead and crucified him. So there is no God, but there was a Jesus, but he was just nothing more than a teacher. And of course, they would tell you there is no Holy Spirit, the third person of the, the triune Godhead. There is no Holy Spirit. There's simply divine energy. Okay? There's just divine energy. Rose Publishing puts out a laminated uh, little booklet. It's very handy. Uh, you can sl slide it right into your Bible. I'll read you a little bit from there. It says, Wiccans do not believe that humanity is sinful or needs saving. It is important for Wiccans to honor and work for the preservation of nature, which they equate with the goddess. Now concerning death, it says, quote, the body replenishes the earth, which is the goddess's wish. Some Wiccans are agnostic about life after death. Others believe in reincarnation. Some believe in a wonderful place called Summerland. Wiccans practice divination and spellcasting, with most rituals performed in a circle. Many Wiccans are part of a coven or a local assembly, though many others are quote-unquote solitary. Covens meet for ritual and seasonal holidays, including the eight major holidays, such as the vernal equinox, summer solstice, and the Beltane. Wicca, listen, Wicca is an occultic, quote-unquote, nature religion, not Satanism. Interesting. It's a nature religion. 
So Wiccans will maintain, well, we're not really practicing magic. Uh, they're more like more along the lines of they're they're uh, born with it. And all we're doing is tap, tapping into the divine energy that already exists within us. You may have heard uh, in the quote from Rose Publishing about the, uh, the various holidays or the wheel of the year. Now, there are eight of them, and I'm going to go through all of them, but I am going to give you two of them. And I want you to, as I, as I describe these two holidays, if they sound familiar to you, uh, one of the holidays, and by the way, they call them Wiccan Sabbats, S-A-B-B-A-T-S. It sounds like Shabbat, but it's without the, uh, without the H. There are eight of them. One of them is called Astara. Astara. And that one is in the spring. It's celebrated on March the 21st. And you celebrate it by coloring eggs. Huh. You color eggs, and, and it has to do with bunnies. And uh, you decorate your home and other dwellings with flowers and things. Now, doesn't in the spring, doesn't that sound familiar? And that's a pagan holiday, a Wiccan Sabbat. Huh, it sounds familiar. Then there's another one. Uh, it's spelled, it, if you look at the spelling, it doesn't actually, it sounds like it's spelled. It's uh, Samhain. Samhain. It's spelled S-A-M-H-I-A-N. Um, that one is celebrated on October the 31st. Uh, Wiccans will uh, practice divination, honoring the dead, and they enjoy carving jack-o'-lanterns on that particular one. And that's interesting because that's also a pagan holiday. So uh, Samhain is a pagan holiday. And that's interesting why I say that because I was driving earlier, uh, actually in Boynton Beach, Florida, and I saw a church and my, my word, out in front of the church, they had all these pumpkins. They were out there. They were s selling pumpkins, and they, had, and they were carving jack-o'-lanterns and all kinds of things out in front of a church. You may have heard moments ago I talked about how they worship the goddess, goddess worship. The worshiping of goddesses. Uh, once again, has been known for thousands of years. Martin writes, he says, the mystery religions of Rome reveal the influence of the goddess Cybele. Isis, goddess of 10,000 names, can be found in different forms throughout the Mesopotamian region and into India in the form of the Indian goddess Kali. A small sampling of the millions of goddesses down through the ages demonstrates that virtually every culture is able to claim the influence of some goddess or another in its long and complex history. And here's just a number. Uh, Martin goes into a number of them in his book. I'll share a few of, of them with you. Uh, he talks about the goddess of uh, uh, Sophia. Sophia, of course, uh, in the Greek is wisdom. Uh, that was a well-known philosophical goddess known to the Alexandrian Gnostics. You have the Canaanite goddess. Asherah, of course, that one's in your Bible. The Greek goddess Artemis, that one you can find in your Bible. Then you have the Roman goddess Fortuna. You have the Celtic goddess Drancia. And, and on and on and on. And of course, if you get the book, you can go ahead and, and read up on uh, those and many others. So, again, in the, in the ancient world, wherever you went, whatever... Uh, uh, nation you travel to, of course, every nation had their own god or goddesses. And so you would go, obviously, you would travel to a nation, and you would attend the temple, you would go into the temple, and and perhaps you found a temple prostitute, and you would worship, of course, the goddesses, or even the gods. And, and, th and that was the ancient world. Well, now we're not in the ancient world anymore. We're in the internet age. And for heaven's sakes, who needs to go ahead and travel around the world? and find these, these temples, and go into these temples, and worship goddesses. <laughs> no! Why would you want to do that? When you can get online and purchase a goddess. Yes, you can purchase a god or a goddess. You can have it delivered right to your home. And in the comfort of your own home, you can tap into all those energies of the natural and supernatural world. Imagine. All that power 
is sitting there with just the click of a, of a mouse. You can tap into the supernatural world. Imagine what you could do with all that power. The worshiping of goddesses. If you haven't noticed, and again, you got to go back to the counterculture, the hippie generation, those years, and the emergence of the feminist movement. Our, especially in the West, you see a you see a moving off of what is known as the patriarchy and onto the matriarchy. Of course, when you look to the scriptures, uh, whether it be um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, Moses led led Israel. You have the various uh, kings like David and Solomon. You have the prophets and even the minor prophets. When you get into the apostolic scriptures, you have Yeshua. He's starting off his ministry. All of his apostles were, were men. Uh, you have uh, Paul, of course, an apostle. He's a man. Um, all the writers of scripture were men. The patriarchy. The founding of America and the founding fathers of America and how they put together the Declaration of Independence and then the, the Constitution. And we call that the patriarchy. And now you see a culture that is moving off of the patriarchy and onto the matriarchy. Well, there's got to be a reason. Martin writes, in neo-paganism, goddesses take precedence over gods and the focus is usually on the, quote, mother. Goddesses take precedence over the gods. The focus is on mother, on the woman. Taken from the encyclopedic dictionary of cults, sex, and world religions. Back to Gerald Gardner. This guy Gardner, again, he went off to Southeast Asia, was dabbling in Malaysian magic. Uh, he became a mason by the way. Uh, afterwards, he became a nudist. He's known as the father of modern witchcraft, and in 1939, he left Southeast Asia, and he came back to England. And he came back to England as an avid occultist. And in the dictionary, it reads, Gardner took the magical resources he acquired in Asia and a selection of Western magical texts and created a new religion centered upon the worship of the mother goddess. This latter point is crucial, for it is precisely mother goddess worship that has become the focus of modern witches. Gardner simply reaffirmed Margaret Murray's thesis that a pre-existent mother goddess religion had been extant through many centuries before the arrival of Christianity, end quote. And so you see, who, who needs Father God? Why should we worship Father God when we should be worshiping Mother Earth? See? And now you start, when you start to kind of, you know, draw the lines and kind of connect the dots, you start to see, okay, now I'm starting to understand this climate change movement which used to be called the global warming movement, which is the green agenda. All of that, all of it, folks, has their roots in witchcraft. It's the worship of Mother Earth. Martin writes, today, the goddess tradition expressed in Wicca and witchcraft is actively studied and taught worldwide, as evidenced by the flood of literature now available in bookstores and on the internet. New leaders have emerged on the neo-pagan scene advocating, listen, social activism in the form of ecofeminism, the linking of goddess power and the preservation of the earth. One of these leaders is a witch, self-named Starhawk, who travels the world promoting her ecofeminist reclaiming tradition of witchcraft. Starhawk actively uh, seeks to promote the growth of witchcraft through education and practice. In her training manual, Circle Round, Raising Children in Goddess Traditions, 
She offers rituals, traditions, songs, crafts, and personal stories like the following, all intended to promote the culture of goddess worship. And this comes from her book, quote, Not long ago, I, Starhawk, was part of a circle of women celebrating the first blood ritual of my goddess daughter, Shannon. We walked a labyrinth cut into a meadow on a ridge of the coastal mountains, we strung necklaces of blessings and beads. We bathed her in a clear stream, trickling through a grotto of moss-covered rocks. The ritual felt as ancient as the spirals we traced on her back and shoulders with henna paste, and at the same time as contemporary as the self-tanning cream her mother added to the paste to make the designs last longer. In that way, our ritual was a perfect expression of the old-slash-new character of the goddess tradition itself. Primeval as the big-bellied sculptures of Paleolithic cave dwellers, modern as the thousands of pagans linked on the internet." End quote. So, after reading that, I went to everybody's favorite search engine, and I just typed in Starhawk. You can do the same. And uh, her real name is Miriam Simos, or Simos. She's 72 years old, and right there in her bio, and you can see it for yourself, it says this, that she honors goddess-based, earth-centered, tribal and pagan spiritual paths. These are Starhawk's general teachings. There are 17 of them. Let me read them to you, and then we'll conclude this first lesson. Number one, witchcraft is a practice. Wicca is a religion. The worship of goddesses, or gods, is foundational to both witchcraft and Wicca. Secondly, multiple goddesses and gods exist as, quote-unquote, spirit parts of the universe. Wicca believes they are different aspects of the one, universal goddess god, the mother of the great horned god, Witchcraft views them as individual unique deities. All the cultures on earth have different and valid names for these deities. Thirdly, the earth is alive. She is the goddess. Let me repeat that. The earth is alive. She is the goddess. Everything on the earth is part of her quote-unquote living body. See? So, it's not like you are anything special that God created with a, with a spirit that will live, for, live forever, that you can have fellowship with God. No, you're just an organism as that, that's just a part of earth, and everything on earth is living, and you're just part of it. Number four, all living things are sacred. Recognize the divine. Wiccans often begin or conclude rites by saying to each other, Thou art goddess, or Thou art God. 5. Experience is the most important thing. Beliefs are secondary. See? Your Bible doesn't mean anything. It's what you experienced. So experience is the most important thing. Beliefs are secondary. There is no right way to believe. Every belief system is valid. Truth is found in experience, not dogma. The universe is like a puzzle, and no one can say they know the right way of putting it together. Six, goddesses and gods have supernatural powers and wisdom that can help people if they take the time to study and learn from them. Seven, human beings, as part of the divine, contain energy, that can be used to affect changes in the world around them. Now, isn't that fun? Imagine, there's an energy inside of you. No, 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 it's not the Holy Spirit doing, doing and, and empo empowering you to perform uh, good works and righteous acts of love. No, it's not that. There's a divine energy that's inside of you. It has nothing to do with God. You just have to tap into it. Number eight, the circle of life consists of birth, maturity, death, and rebirth. Number nine, after death, 
the spirit goes to a place of beauty and peace called the Summerlin, where it considers the things it should have learned in its previous life. When all the lessons have been pondered and assimilated, the spirit is free to be reborn into a new form. See? Reincarnation. Number 10. The Sutherland, or Summerlin, is not heaven. And not all spirits must re reincarnate. They may choose to stay and act as spirit guides for the people they love. Or if they do not need to reincarnate, they may be reunited with the goddess. Now, how many times have you heard somebody say, you know, my... My, my, my husband, or, or when we were, we were married for so long, and, and he passed away, and you know, he's my guardian angel now. Or my mother from long ago, I remember she was such a, she was such a dear, sweet woman, and, and she's my guardian angel now. Folks, that, that is found nowhere in your Bible. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. When someone dies... They either go to Hades, awaiting the great white throne judgment, or they go to paradise, waiting the judgment seat of Christ. There is no such thing as spirit guides. Number 11. A soul that chooses to reincarnate also chooses the lesson it needs to learn. Once back on earth, it does not remember the lesson and must discover what it is. 12. There is no such thing as original sin, evil, or Satan. People may harbor negative energies within them, but most are basically good. See, there is no such thing as sin. Yet your Bible says sin came through Adam. And when she says people are basically good, your Bible says there are none who are righteous, not even one. Ver uh, number 13. It is not possible to call up the dead, but they often communicate to the living in dreams. And then Martin puts a note in here. Note, Many neo-pagans would disagree with the idea that it is impossible to call up the dead. 14. Magic. And by the way, magic, she spells with a K, just like Aleister Crowley. Magic is a way to change things within and without. It affects the energy surrounding individuals, and when that energy changes, people or circumstances change. Magic can heal and accomplish good things. 15. Bad magic exists, but if a pagan chooses to send it out, it will more than likely rebound on them. 16. All life depends on the four sacred elements, air, fire, water, and earth. All rituals rely upon their energy. And lastly, number 17. A fifth element, called the spirit, is found in the center, the inside of a person. It is the place where love is felt. Well, on that note, let's pause, and when we get back together again, we'll look at the second and final part of this look at goddess worship, witchcraft, and Wicca.